Welcome to Startup Jab. Welcome to Startup Jab. I'm Teague Hopkins, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Jason Ellis. Say hi, Jason. Hi, Jason. See, that's uh, funny. See, see, that's funny. Anyway, how are you, sir? Funny. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. Um, as, uh, as Dale in the chat says, we're in Monday mode right now. That's so true. We're, uh, we're, we're a little, <clears throat> we're a little uh, slow off the ball today. That, that would be my fault. Uh, I'm currently traveling on the West Coast doing some business development for my agency, Brilliant. And unfortunately, uh, I had to throw Teague's schedule off. That's on me. So I apologize to everyone. Yeah. Well, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We'll so, indeed. So, so, Teague, how are you? How are things? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Good. Um, this is, uh, this is we're, yeah, as Jason said, we're moving this up a, a few hours today um, to accommodate his traveling schedule, but we'll be back to our regularly scheduled time next week. Yes, indeed. Probably. Probably. Why not? Um, today, we're going to talk about what matters in the beginning. Uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of articles. We'll take some questions from the mailbag and questions from, uh, from those of you who are listening live in the chat room as well. So... Uh, yeah. Sounds good yeah. to me. You jump right in. Yes, sir. Um, I was thinking that we could start with, and I'll pull the thread to throw in the chat here. Um, I was thinking that we could start with a Reddit thread that I suggested. Would you be okay with starting there? Yeah, let's go there. Okay. So for those of you who are uh, watching live, you'll be able to see this in the chat and those pre-recorded, uh, you'll see this in the show notes. Um, I came across an interesting thread on our startups. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, I highly recommend it. Uh, great resource for all things startup related, including advice, um, responses to suggestions about uh, how to build a startup. And one of the interesting things is that people will do their own case studies around what has worked and what hasn't for their business. Um, so I came across this, which uh, the title of which is, so now we're over $2 million per year with local services, quote, parentheses, crazy to even be able to type that, end quote, end parentheses. I really can't. <laughs> it's not my strong suit today. The coffee is not kicked in. Here's how we set ourselves apart from the competition, the tools we use to accomplish this, and a super transparent product launch to see how we got out of the gate. So this is the story of a startup founder who in the last three and a half years has built no less than five companies which combined generate $2.5 million per year in revenue. Um, you know, he then goes through an incredibly transparent background on how they got started, how they mm -hmm. developed their different strategies, what the answers were that they came through. And, and um, it's a remarkable deep dive into, you know, what has worked and what hasn't for certain startups. And I find it really fascinating that we're sort of living in a world now where this kind of transparency is, is available to us because, I mean, this is just a ton of information. Yeah, and, and there's there's not a lot of you know there's not a lot of companies that are willing to be that transparent with it. Obviously, think, mm -hmm. companies like Buffer are the exception, um, where they you know post all kinds of internal information, including financials and and you know team members' salaries and the formula that they use to determine those salaries, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily work for everybody. But it's great that they're doing that. Um, but but th here's another example. And this this you know in, in a lot of ways this one may be a, an example that is more. Um, relevant for for folks who are who are starting out and who are who are doing some of this, um, you know, in a lot of ways, Buffer has great transparency, but they're also kind of an outlier, and so it's not necessarily a, a great template for somebody else to follow. Yeah, um, I think that the interesting thing about uh, a breakdown like this is more than anything else, it cuts to the. I mean, even though there's a lot of information here, it really cuts to the chase about what worked really well for them. So they talked about their early strategies about, you know, just use more images, which frankly is just a, a really good best practice for anybody, no matter your business. Um, you know, uh, using more video, I mean, live, you know, live content, and then getting all the way down to things like, you know, using more human faces, make sure that your, your, you know, your pay, your checkout page is really short and that it's just one page that you really think deeply about better design and customer experience. And then it really gets into things like exit monitors, um, you know, friend referrals, customer transactions, uh, how you can use the site for more built-in recurring revenue. Um, it's really interesting to, um, you know, to really just, uh, uh, get a clear sense of sort of some of the basic strategies that they've put together. Uh, pretty good for everybody, I think. 
except what was your UT, favorite? Except for UT, you're perfect. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite strategy? Um, well, I'll, well, I'll admit it's uh, it's a little too close to the vest on me, but I think the fact that more sites don't use video uh, is really frustrating. Um, not to mention the fact that most people who do use video use video that's way too long or way too convoluted. Um, I, you know, as somebody who used to work in long form television online, I really had a problem with you know, people telling me that anything under three minutes, nobody would pay attention to. But now that I'm on this side of the tracks, I can tell you anything less than two minutes is going to be your sweet spot. So, 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 so are you saying that we shouldn't be doing uh, no, no one should use like an hour long video of talking heads? No, no, they <laughs> good. shouldn't. Good, good, good to know. Yeah. Noted. No, I think if you're gonna put if you're gonna put a video like this on the front page of your website, you have a serious problem. If you're gonna put a That's one true. minute expl explanation around who you are, what you do, and why you're really interesting, go for it. And yes, yes, as Kiki's mentioning in the chat, how very meta. Mm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite piece of it was 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 uh, after the case study. The the what do you do when you try something and it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. And and I love the response to that was you know okay, I wrap things up go catch a movie or something. And by the next day, I'm ready to think about what the next thing is. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that idea of when it doesn't work, you just set it down for a while, you go, you know, do something that, 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 you know, restores your energy and come back at it ready to, to try again the next day. Because the way that you handle failure as an entrepreneur is so crucial to whether you're actually able to be successful. You need to be able to try something and when it doesn't work, have a process for getting back on the horse as quickly as possible. And, you know, giving yourself permission to take that break to recharge. Couldn't agree more. I, I think that the, there's a, we've talked about this a little bit offline. There's a little bit of a misconception around what the concept of failure really means. Um, uh, failure yes. is, if we're talking about the actual true meaning of what failure should be, failure is when you screw up, you have to break something and, or, or stop doing something, and then you do nothing with that. Right, that's failure. Not failure is not the same thing as I fell, I picked myself up, I dusted myself off, and I got going again. And I think that we we tend to misuse that word because it's a great buzzword, right? I failed, but I started up again. What you didn't fail, you learned. Learning is far more important. Progress is well, far more important. Exactly. Unless you didn't learn, in which case you just failed. Right. No. Exactly. Right. And I think that's that's the you know that's the other side of the yeah. of the uh, of the spectrum where you know a lot of times in particularly in the lean startup community. Mm -hmm. um, we talk a lot about, you know, celebrating failure and yeah. how sometimes that becomes a problem of too much of celebrating the failure and not enough of celebrating the learning. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the key part there is that you do actually have to learn something. You can't just say you learn something, right? There, there's this there's this sort of uh, bad habit amongst many entrepreneurs yeah. that they're like, no, 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 I totally got a lot out of that. And it's horseshit. It is not true. You actually have to learn a lesson. So anyway. Cool. Was there other stuff you liked from that uh, from that Reddit? There's Reddit? a lot in there. I think it's absolutely worth people take, you know, taking out. Uh, I think the one thing too that they address is that what if you lose a little bit of money building something and then you fail? You know, if you lose fifty or a hundred thousand dollars, you know, that's a huge problem. But you know, the idea of losing a couple grand to start your own business, you, you can't think of it as losing. You have to think of it as an investment. You lose money when you right. gamble. You lose money when you play poker. You don't lose money when you spent $2,000 and learned more than $20,000 of education would buy you. Right. Yeah. When you, when, you, when you compare a lot of startup costs to the cost of a graduate degree, it seems cheap by comparison. Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, uh, definitely worth a check out if anybody's got, uh, you know, five or 10 minutes to, to check it out and see some cool stuff. And they're taking still, I think for a while, at least they were still taking questions. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, T, nice. what have you been reading yeah. recently? Uh, a couple of things. So actually, before we, before we go too far, much further, we forgot to mention the top of the show, the prize for fastest subscriber of the week goes to Dale, mm. um, who did beat Jason to subscribing. In, uh, in my defense, she's a lot better than I am. <laughs> that's uh that's fair that's yeah. a reasonable defense yeah it's the the dale defense maybe maybe if she's feeling maybe if she's feeling generous we'll get her in here later but i i'm not going to force anybody on anything reasonable indeed um so one of the actually there's there's an article that i wanted to share as well i'm going to drop this link in the chat um this article is called the reasons we work mm -hmm. um, and I, part of what I love about it is actually just this graphic at the top that has the sources of motivation. So we're talking today about um, what matters in the beginning. And when you're starting a startup, it's important to know 
why you're starting it, why you're doing the things you're doing, what are the reasons you're working on it, what is your motivation, and where does your motivation come from? Um, and so the article lists sort of six buckets for for you know places for motivation to come from, um, three direct and three indirect. Um, uh oh. And uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, did we lose Jason? I think we just lost Jason. All right. Um, while we're waiting for Jason to rejoin, I will continue. Um, so the the six types of, mo of motivation that we um, that the article talks about is um, the first one is play, which is when you do something for the act of doing the thing itself. Um, and so it's it's the idea that you're you're doing something not because of what it might get you, but because it actually is an activity that you just inherently enjoy. Um, the second type of motivation is purpose, where you're doing something because you because it um, aligns with your identity, your values, or your beliefs, um, or because of potential, um, which is similarly aligned with those, but because it prepares you for something in the future. Um, and then the indirect motives. Uh, that they list are emotional pressure, economic pressure, or inertia. So these are when external forces are encouraging us to do something. Um, in the case of emotional pressure, it might be because you know we're trying to make somebody happy or we're trying to um, feel good about ourselves. Uh, economic pressure is because we're doing it maybe because we need the money, we need to be able to, to pay rent. Um, there's Jason joining yeah. us back in. Sorry about that, guys. The internet crashed. Super exciting. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Um, and then the last form of motivation is is inertia where you are doing something simply because you've been doing it that way and i think in a lot of cases it's the well we've you know we've always done it this way so we'll just keep doing it that way um yeah yeah I, and, and it, oh, it's a great it's a great graphic because it's just it's a it's a simple summary to sort of look at why are we actually doing the things we're doing well and i think too that that it's important to <laughs> i think it's important <laughs> to understand you okay there okay fatigue is apparently choking on water uh, you drink it. You don't breathe it. Um, I think it's ah, that's what I've been doing wrong. It's true. I think that it's so interesting to me that there are so many people who sort of try to jump to try to jump as far as they can and as close as they can to inertia. Um, I, I find it really interesting that there are a lot of people out there who, in many ways, are working to work. They're working to get into that sort of nine to five rhythm. They're not interested in really building anything. Mm -hmm. They're simply, you know. I want to draw a paycheck. I'm not passionate about this. I'm ready to move on. Um, I think that, that that to me is the beginning of the death spiral in a lot of ways, that, that that sense that you have to get to the place where things just run on autopilot and you don't have to think about it. Then it's not fun. Yeah. Well, and I think that you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at it in terms of what things you're doing for what reasons and, and maybe some of those some of the, the reasons you're doing things will tell you what how you actually feel about it yeah right if you're if you're doing something because well that's you know you've, you've been doing it that way or because you needed the money then it's probably not a, a particularly high uh source of motivation for you sure absolutely um what are the motivations that are listed there did you find most compelling well i think obviously the 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 thing that I find, well, okay, maybe not, maybe not obviously, but the thing that I find really interesting is how you, how people think about um, why they, uh, why they work at their job, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people recognize the difference between working for economic pressure and working for, say, purpose, right? If you're working towards something you believe in. And, and what's interesting to me is, is how do you get from, from purpose to play, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get from doing something because you, um, because you care about, the the you know the subject matter that you're working on versus doing something because you actually enjoy what you are doing simply for its itself yeah um, and and you know I think it's it's probably worth um, recognizing that you know n not every job is going to be great all the time right and so maybe maybe the best job you know maybe the, the best type of motivation would be sometimes it feels like play and sometimes it feels like purpose right even even when you're doing the stuff about the stuff in the job that you don't actually really love for itself you still recognize that you know you're you're working towards something that you care about absolutely no i i think that that's 100 percent true um yeah i mean i think that that i think a lot of things um I think for me, the the challenges around the indirect motives um, are really where you move from you know want to need so economic pressure, emotional pressure, 
uh, even inertia to an extent. Sure, yeah. um, those are the scariest parts of, of sort of why we do what we do. Um, the, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that there are a lot of people who end up in positions because they get stuck there um, because of those very reasons. And then they end up deeply unhappy. And that's the opposite of what this should be. I mean, you don't always have to do what you love, but you should love what you do. And when you don't, then what's the point? And, and I, I like that in particular. That's that's a, a, a turn of phrase that I'm that I'm very fond of that you, you don't necessarily have to do what you love, but you should love what you yeah. do. Right. And because in a lot of ways, you know, the advice to to simply do what you love is um, <clears throat> it's easy to give and, and hard to follow. Right. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times, if you if you try to do something that is something that you thought you loved, once you turn it into a job, you no longer love it. Um, and it becomes, you know, it becomes a chore and it becomes it, particularly if it's something that's, you know, not particularly high valued or not paid well, you may start to resent it and resent the fact that it's, you know, that it's having this impact on your life. Whereas if you find something that you're able to love be, while you're doing it, yeah. you can, you can really, you know, you can sink your teeth into something that maybe wasn't, maybe you didn't love it when you started, but, but by, by the process of, of learning and getting better at something, you can yeah. really enjoy what you're doing and, and find something that, you know, it's, you, you shouldn't necessarily have to do what you love, but you should never do something you hate. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the turn of phrase doesn't come from me. I wish I could claim credit for it. The line, the, the do what you love is the, we work, uh, the WeWork um, basically tagline. And actually it's Mike Rowe who turned it and flipped it. Um, Mike Rowe of, of Dirty Jobs and, and all that stuff. And I really like his philosophy on things that, that, you know, in, that there should never be, for example, there should never be a job that Americans don't want, right? Because that suggests that we're somehow superior to some other nationality that, that is willing to take some shit job we don't want. Yeah, um, right. And I think a lot of times we get into this sort of cycle of, it's not self-value. It's self-aggrandizing. The sense I'm better than this. I'm I'm more than this. I'm beyond this. I mean, look, we've all had jobs where you know, I've done it. I've had jobs where I've cleaned houses and you know flipped coffee and you know all that. You know, slung coffee, flip burgers. That's what I was going for. Um, I never actually. I never made burgers. I did flipping coffee doesn't get you a lot of tips. Flipping coffee. I got to be honest with you. Got me in a lot of trouble one day. Um, <laughs> but, but it's not even necessarily that you have to to love it. It's just that you have to embrace it. I think you have to be good with the fact that this is the value that you're bringing to somebody's day. Even if that value is in a large corporation where it's moving paper from one step to another, that may be actually making somebody's life a lot easier, that that job was hopefully created to bring real value. And yeah, as Nick is saying in the chat here, I mean, you know, you know, my, he's saying his last job he ever worked was cleaning gutters. I'm imagining you probably clean those gutters damn well because that's your job and you should do it right. So anyway, that's enough of my little pontification. It's, so uh, what's up next? That's a good question. Let's discuss what's up next. Oh, here we go. Well, speaking of jobs, actually, I think that this is a good one. So uh, Business Insider uh, posted something quite recently around um, 12 mistakes that people make in their resumes, which by itself is not a terribly exciting um, article, although it's certainly worth going over if you're looking for a job. But no, what's interesting about it to me is the fact that we still use resumes and the fact that these things still have to represent our lives in, you know, sort of, you know, Word document format. Um, you know, the fact that we haven't taken, um, you know, the fact that we haven't taken essentially things like LinkedIn and and just made it sort of the common thing that we all use for professional experience representation really baffles me. In the same way that colleges are now figuring out that the common application should just be the central way that everybody applies for college, why have we not all agreed that there's a certain format and just everything is just the same so that we can get past this stylistic bullshit and just get to the core of it, which is somebody's got experience that either works or doesn't, and we should figure that out. Interesting. So I... I'm not sure that there's a, a a single you know a single option that works for all of these because there's a lot more variation between companies than there is between colleges, right? Sure. Um, and you know, the, I I acknowledge that in a lot of cases, you know, LinkedIn probably has all the information you need. You may not need a separate resume, depending on you know the quality of your LinkedIn profile. Um, and, uh, and and Nick in the chat is saying his wife sends YouTube videos instead of resumes. I've also seen um, organizations ask for videos mm -hmm. instead of resumes. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting to see some of the other stuff that people are trying. I, I, uh, one, one, there's a, there's a company, I guess, or a, a organization movement trying to do a, the, like the no resumes mm -hmm. project where yeah. instead of submitting a resume, you submit like a paragraph talking about, you know, in, 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 in many cases, not even like your, 
your you know biggest professional accomplishment or anything like that, but you know what's something that you did that you were proud of? Yeah, um, because you get all kinds of interesting answers that that might help you uncover folks who you know don't traditionally look as strong on paper, but when you hear about what they're doing for their hobby, you're like, holy crap, this person is mm -hmm. amazing, and you know they're they're doing stuff that that you know we can use. Um, the so so if we look at the 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 business insider article here though yeah. are there are there things in there that you agree with or disagree with in terms of like what belongs in either in a resume or in you know what you're going to send to an employer to say like here's well, who I am in a nutshell well first of all i think the fact that somebody made a conscious effort to choose, to make a comment about the font choice is silly it's times new roman in this thing i mean unless they've thrown out comic sans who cares i mean i really just that level of detail really bothers me um yeah. and, and in fact i think the only thing about about font that you might say is that you know if you're trying to get attention by changing the font you're probably focusing on the wrong things exactly um, but things like, you know, there are some things that I agree with, you know, listing, listing address is just, you know, something you shouldn't do anymore because it's a good safety thing. Um, you know, That's interesting. yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't think that you need to include a LinkedIn profile. I mean, there's just little things in here that drive me nuts. If you're giving me your resume, do I also need your LinkedIn profile? I mean, I guess, um, this is for something beyond sort of like your initial application out of college. You know, this is if you're three or four years into your career and you're starting to grow up in terms of your resume, that's all well and good, but things like, yeah. I, I do think yeah. this was specifically targeted at mid-level employees. And I think it is relevant to, to mention like, yeah, you probably shouldn't still list your GPA. You sure. probably shouldn't list uh, internships that you had while in college, right? Nobody yeah. cares about that once you've gotten, once you've had several jobs after college. Right. Well, um, and as, as, as our friends at the Good Lemon are saying in the chat here, I mean, you know, it's all subjective is the problem. None of this is, if this were all a, some sort of standard against which, you know, there's a minimum we'd have to agree on, that's fine. But the truth is that, that, you know, the things that turn people off aren't just that, you know, certain sections are bulleted or certain sections are GPA. I mean, there's been studies done that show if your name is Joe versus Jose, that generates different responses. I mean, we show such bias and, and sometimes such cultural or, you know, racist, you know, negative tendencies that, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I prefer, you know, anybody who we're seriously interested in for a job, if they hit certain bullet points, they've, you know, they've gotten a certain level of experience that we're interested in. We'll just bring them into chat with them because you learn so much more about somebody in a 20 minute conversation than you do than in, you know, in every mountain of paperwork that you could get on them. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, and I, and I think that it's the, the, the point about bias is, is a good point, right? If you're, if you're looking at resumes and you don't have a rubric for scoring them or some uh, some codified method for deciding who you're going to interview and who you're not going to, mm -hmm. you're basically relying on pattern matching. Right. And humans are not nearly as good at pattern matching as we think we are. Right. We're good at pattern matching for certain things. We've we've gotten good at at like recognizing when there's a tiger about to pounce on us and things like that because over many many millennia we've developed these these you know mental heuristics that help us in that kind of pattern yeah. matching. But pattern matching for you know looking at a resume and saying, yeah, this person seems like they might be a good employee or not a good employee. Right. Give me a break. Is fraught with all kinds of, of you know, confirmation bias yeah. and, and, and implicit association bias and all kinds of problems. Well, and, that, um, and, and, and we're taking such a boil down of a person's experience and putting it into, you know, 20 or 30 words. I mean, it's silly. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of, of uh, things that, that humans are not as good at pattern matching as they think they are. Uh, raising money for startups is very highly based on pattern matching, right? If you look like the, the you know, if you, if you look like the kind of company that matches what the VC is expecting to see as the kind of company that they want to invest in, you may be able to raise money. If you don't look like that, you've got an uphill battle. And so yeah. <laughs> moving on to our next article, where should you focus before raising capital? Oh, you, you and your transitions. I'm so proud of you. I work um, really hard on these segues, man. I know right you now. do. I know you do. Well, listen, it, you, uh, you know, you've certainly covered, uh, certainly covered the right base to get there. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, but you know, we, uh, we are in the midst of a, of a, you know, a startup bubble as the article purports. 
that you know that there are over 500,000 companies that will be started in this you know this month alone in the US venture capitals will write less than 100 checks over you know over the next 30 days and that angel investors will add over just 4,000 so basically we've got 495,000 companies that are just good luck um which raises the point that you know look if if you're looking for funding you're doing it wrong. If if you want to, you know, bet against those odds, that's fine. But be clear, you're betting against strong odds. Um, and you've the article has identified three different portions of the startup cycle, the different phases of the startup cycle. You want to talk about those a little bit? Yeah. Um, first, I want to take a, a question from the chat here, Nick. Oh, oh, I think we lost Jason. Uh, okay. So um, did I lose Nick you again? In the chat you asked. Uh, do you think people go for capital for startups that don't need it and shouldn't have it? I think that absolutely happens. Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of cases it is, uh, it is, you know, folks want to raise capital because I think if I raise capital, it means I have a good idea, right? Um, and I think the 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 challenge sometimes is that you know if you look at raising money as the success factor, then you're looking at the wrong metrics, right? Raising money should actually be uh, should actually be looking at it as a okay. Well, we we couldn't do this without raising money, so we actually have to raise money in order to move forward. And if you don't have to, why would you necessarily? Um, mm. Absolutely. I think, you know, in in a lot of cases, you're 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 better off trying to go as far as you can by bootstrapping. And if you end up needing money, then uh, you'll have at least proven your business model to some degree and, and be in a better position to raise that, that money. Agreed. Um, do you think that there is a, well, as is uh, as Malik is asking in the chat here, do you think there's a correct way to get funding? Although he's specifically asking about cloud funding, which I'm, I'd actually love some clarification on what you mean by cloud funding, Malik. Is that as in crowdfunding? Like yeah, it may be crowdfunding. Okay. Um, Let's let's assume, and then we'll we'll see if there's a correction that needs to happen. But yeah, what are your thoughts on on crowdfunding? Um, you know, do you go the Kickstarter route? Do you go more sort of the you know now that you have the ability to um, you know raise from much smaller investors thanks to the easing from the uh, the FEC or not the FEC? Hello, it's not the election. Um, SEC. SEC. Thank you. Yep, um, now I got you. Yeah. What do you think? I think it, I think it's it's. I think it would be a disservice to try to answer that question that broadly because it's so different for different companies, right? Like if you are, so if we're looking at say you're crowdfunding a, a creative project mm -hmm. on Kickstarter, for example, um, it's really important that you cater to sort of the, the, um, the people who are going to be enjoying the, the final product. And so you want to create, you know, teaser videos and, and, and a lot of content around, um, what the experience of the of the final product is going to be like. If you are trying to raise funding from an angel investor or a VC, you have to make a case for why your company could return 10x what mm -hmm. they're investing in it. Yeah. Right. And and a lot of that is about um I think it's Guy Kawasaki who says uh you need to catalyze fantasy. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't tell somebody that your business is going to have hockey stick growth. Show them how it could and then let them recognize and say, oh hey, this could have hockey stick growth. Because if you tell someone then they're immediately going to be on the defensive and looking for ways to poke holes in your theory. But if you show them the facts and let them draw the conclusion on their own, they're going to feel very smart because they've figured out, oh, hey, this is something that, you know, I see the potential here and not everybody necessarily does. Absolutely. Um, and I would add in too that, that before engaging in any sort of direct, you know, funding of any kind, crowd or otherwise, you really want to get some professional advice in, in the realm of like, Somebody who takes a, a really deep dive look at the business plan that you have, the model, make sure that you've you know developed the market fit, ensure that above everything else that the concept has legs once it gets the funding and can start to scale. Too many people try to search for funding too early, and it just ends up breaking the idea and the concept because they have no foundation. They have no way to actually use the money in any sort of meaningful way. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is that the, the steps you need to take pre-funding are the same steps you would take if you weren't raising funding mm -hmm. for the most part, right? So the the article here on where to focus before raising capital, the the uh, the, the TLDR version is uh, number one: add customers, not product. Mm -hmm. 
right? So focus on on building a customer base, not on building more features to your product and making it this this multi feature thing. Do do a small thing, do it well for a for a growing number of users, and focus on growing that number of users because the features you think you need to add probably aren't the features that they want you to add. And so once you actually have people using it, you have that feedback loop to mm -hmm. help you actually build the right things. Yeah. Um, number two is make revenue a priority. Um, there's a lot of startups that that you know a lot of I guess you could say the unicorn startups that follow this model of like try not to have revenue for as long as possible, so that you know, so that there's no reality to, to this, you know, to, to the yeah. to the, to bring it back down to earth, right? There, if you if you don't have any funding or if you don't have any revenue, you can just say, oh, we've got tons of users, and you know, once we monetize them, who boy, look out. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm much more. I mean. It also depends on your goals in life. You, if you're going for a unicorn, I suppose it's different than I'm going to build a profit. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you want to play the lottery, obviously it's a little bit different. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and the third one they, they mentioned is, is raise on metrics, not story. And I think you could equally say if you're not planning to raise money, then focus on metrics, not story. Yeah. Right. The story is a nice thing to tell yourself and to you know tell people at, at cocktail parties so they think that you're amazing and impressive. But what really matters, both for funders and for the success of your business, is what the metrics are. Whether you've got you know what is your conversion rate? Do you have revenue? What is your profit margin? You know what's your customer acquisition cost? What's your churn rate? Those are the things that actually make a difference to your business. Not you know we were featured on the front of some magazine. Right. Exactly. Um... I want to take a left turn for just a second. Christine from the chat has a great question that I, I want to take a look at because it's, well, the question is, is it normal to have a second seed round, which I think is very parallel to, I'm getting hair in all these funny places. Is that normal? Um, nope. No, I was trying for the spit take. You didn't go for it. That's a shame. It did not go for the spit take. It's a shame. Sorry. No, but I think, I think it, it, there is no such thing, Christine, in this particular instance as normal versus not. It is totally fine to have a second seed round. It is possible that you under in the first one, that the model has changed. And there's about 15 different ways in which, you know, this can work. Um, it, it, it's perfectly acceptable to answer your question. It's not, um, it's not abnormal. It's not conventional. Usually seeds, if done properly, lead to larger rather than a second seed. But that isn't, that's just based, I think, on just the pure number of them that go out there. I don't think it matters well, one way or the other. And, and I think the definition of, of seed versus series A versus series B yeah. versus, you know, friends and family round, even before seed funds, maybe th those change and those are dynamic. And, and it's not, you know, a second round might be a seed round if it's less than a certain amount. You might call it a seed round versus a Series A, but you could equally, you know, there's a, there's some in the in the range there where it, you might call it either one. Right. Um, and I just put in the chat, and I'll make sure it gets in the show notes too. A little brief thing on um, seed rounds. So um, the difference that we're basically talking about is that a seed, a Series seed, is essentially getting product fit, right? And if you burn through the first one and you go, wow, we didn't quite nail it yet. We need some more money to get there. Um, it's usually not unacceptable. It's just, you're going to be giving up a little bit more equity and you're just, you know, you're seeding it early to try to make something grow. Um, you know, generally after that, it's, it's, you know, scaling market and business, you know, business model, then scaling business, then more capital, et cetera. So, I mean, you know, I think that more often than not, you know, yeah, as Frank is saying in the chat, there are no clear rules. It's changes happening all the time. There is no agreement one way or another. Um, the challenge is for you to be able to identify somebody on the inside, is this the right move? Because a seed round for one company, you know, two seed rounds rather, may be the right thing because you still need to explore product fit. Or it could represent that your founders are a little skittish and scared and they don't feel that they've got it right and that this may be the wrong move. We can't speak to that. You can. Um, yeah, I mean, again, sophistication certainly matters. Um, you know, it also depends on your fit with the market. So. Frank seems to know what he's talking about in this area. I suspect that if you ask him, he may give you some more information as well. We are not investors. This is not our strength. That's not true. I invest in Teague because I like him. And he invests in me because he needs community service hours. <laughs> just the one. Just the one dig. Good. Anyway. Good. All right. All right. Fair. Uh, so um, whenever we're talking about uh, raising capital, it's it's also interesting to talk about the 
process of wow you've got some weird noises in the background there yeah so as i've been saying in the chat i apologize for those listening to the podcast so i'm staying with friends one of whom is a sound engineer and he is working on animation right now um he's working specifically he's doing a little he's not doing foley at the moment what he's doing actually is he's going through a sound library for sound effects um he's good he's working on some cartoons that are near and dear to our hearts um uh, i am in uh, i'm in los angeles as i mentioned earlier so at the moment i'm uh what can i tell you i'm I'm listening. You're listening to to the work of Hollywood behind me. Oh God! Excellent. That's a frightening Excellent. thought. That's um, fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, what I was going to say is, uh, whenever we talk about um, raising money, we also it's, it's interesting to talk about startup ideas mm -hmm. um, and ideas and concepts uh, as separate from businesses, right? Um, the you know. My my first word of warning is if you run into a, a co-founder who says, "Oh, I'm I'm the ideas person," run screaming the other way. Yep. Right. Um, there's no space for people who have ideas but don't execute. Um, there's an article here that I've just put in the chat, and we'll get it into the show notes as well. Um, that's from the Harvard Business Review on uh, can you predict a startup's success based on the concept alone? Um, and they have a lot of you know research that's gone into this they've done a study and and you know the the spoiler alert version is no no you cannot which should come as no surprise to anybody who's paying attention but i love that somebody actually went and did the research to see whether you could actually predict based on this, the concept alone right and i think in many cases it's easier to, to predict success based on the founders alone than yeah. it is on the concept alone and in many cases, that's who gets invested in, right? This, the, the angel investors are looking for people to invest in because they believe that they will be able to figure something out. Yeah. And like the, the concept is in a lot of ways is just the, you know, it's your first iteration always, right? It's, it's not going to be the final version unless you happen to get lucky. Yeah. Um, yes. As Frank in the chat says, investors back people, not ideas. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yep. Well, and I think too that that you know we've talked about, and here comes Kiki's eye roll. We've talked about the lean startup method as being a great way to identify ideas and concepts that. Oh, it's cool. Validity. I mentioned lean startup already. We're safe. Oh, good. Thank God. Yeah, I rolled at me earlier. All right. Perfect. Yeah. At least I wasn't here for it this time. the The challenge that we always find is that you know a lot of people come up with a really interesting idea, and I say interesting because conceptually it sounds really cool. I mean, if you're talking about um, you know the Airbnb for you know, Airbnb for cat people only, or, um, you know, the home joy for video gamers or, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, I don't look at me like that, Teague. I don't like it when you give me that. I, 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 want, I want to see how many of these ideas you can just spit out and whether any of them. Sure. Well, the, 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 the Uber for shirt presses, wait, that's, that's washy out. Never mind. Um, well, yep, yep. Yep. How many of these things already exist? Yeah. <laughs> many of them probably. <laughs> Yeah, we could do it as as the good Levin is saying. We could do an entire show based solely on my bad ideas, the blank of blank. Um, but I think what's what's what sets the right people apart are those who do two things. One, they find the right people, as as has been said many times in the chat today. Um, and the other is that that they find ideas that are proven. I think we we used to live in a world that people would bank on a good business plan, the idea that you had some sort of navigational map that would get you through the choppy waters to smooth sailing. Um, mm. And now, now what we're really banking on is that you've gone out and you established that there is real research in the market to say, this is a need, we need this now. Um, and, and even if you're, you know, even if not, I mean, even if you're taking the, the product fit sort of on a, on a wish and a prayer that you've at least got that in mind. Um, I had the fortune to chat with a friend of mine uh, who is uh, over at Kleiner Perkins. And he has been talking about how he really wants to work with clients, or he work with, with investments where they've really, really figured out what their product fit is. Because then once they've done that legwork, he can take them and he can, he can you know, in three months, he can turn them into a real company. Um, I... You mean I once they've that. done the hard part, he can do something easy with it? <laughs> well, they've done the first hard part. Let's be clear that the, that's, that's only one hard part. Yeah. And when I say that they've done the product fit, it's not as though they've done it magically by themselves. They've done it with guidance. They've done it with direction. And they've done it with somebody who's making sure that their investment is going to be worthwhile. When we talk about the product fit part, it's because they've already invested in them. So they have some, they have some skin in the game already. Yeah. As Frank is saying, it's all the hard part. There is no easy part. <laughs> it's all the hard part. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, some great ideas in here, Uber, Uber for personal trainers. I think that's a great idea. I think there are a couple of people already working on that. The Netflix of dog grooming. Sure. Subscription I dog thought... grooming. I think is a thing that they're actually, oh, is, oh, is, oh, is that how that would work? Okay. That's... I was, I was gonna say, I, I want to know how that works. Is that like, you know, 
streaming videos of how to groom your dog? Or is that like, like you send your dog to the groomer and then they get to watch movies while they get groomed. D Dale is sitting here being <laughs> like, you guys, it was a joke. I didn't actually mean it. <laughs> anyway, point being, I, I think that, that no, I, I think to the point of this article, you know, inspiration is great. Ideas are great. And you may actually come up with an idea that by itself even doesn't take market research. It's just such an obvious need that you can sort of find very quick evidence to confirm the fact that it's necessary. But you can't just, you know, you can't just base anything on an idea alone because if you can't execute it well, you can't execute it well. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, go ahead. So if it's all about people, yeah. let's, let's talk about how you make people successful. Mm. Um, Oh, you. This is my, this is my segue into the, next, into the next article, right? Yeah. So, so um, I'll start with the, the quote from Deming, which I which I love, and which this article mentioned: um, "A bad system will defeat a good person every time." Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know we we all sort of intuitively know this that you, you've seen companies where even the best people are thwarted time and again because the structure of the organization is not set up to take advantage of their of their skills and the value they bring to the table. Um, or even you have, you know, many good people, but you put them in a system that doesn't work well and they they end up clashing instead of supporting each other. Um, so I, I, I found a couple of articles here because I, I was I was uh, pointed to Lex Sisney's thoughts on why you don't need a COO at a startup. Um, and I will put that article in the chat here. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll talk about that a little bit and then also talk a little bit about, uh, some of his, his broader, um, some of his broader ideas in, uh, the classic mistakes in organizational structure. Um, and, uh, and Jason has dropped off again, so I'm just going to keep talking until he shows up. Um, so in, in the, the idea of, of why we don't need a, a COO in a startup, um, Lex Disney talks about the sort of two major mistakes that organizations make when they're thinking about adding a COO and, in, in some cases, you see, you know, the, the, CEO, the COO is a um, is a title that's given to the non CEO founder as, you know, as as kind of a, a as an ego play or as a as a you know a way to make them um, to show to people external to the company that they are relevant in discussions with potential clients and and customers and and investors and that has its place. the The danger is when you when you then structure the organization in in one of a couple ways. Um, the, the first one is is what he calls the, the Queen of England model, um, which is where you have your CEO at the top of the, of the top of the food chain and you have it, the, the COO reporting to them and all of the other heads reporting to the COO. So the COO manages all the internal stuff and the CEO manages the external stuff. Um, the, the problem with that model is that you end up sort of marginalizing the CEO and you end up with with a question as to who is actually running the organization, right? Is the if if the COO goes to somebody and says, "Well, you know, we're we're doing this this way," and the CEO then says something contradictory because they're not on the same page because one is focused externally and the other is focused internally, what kind of problems does that does that raise? Um, the the way to sort of to 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 handle that and and make it more successful um, is to Rather than than having the um, the COO act as the as the intermediary, um, have this have them function more like a chief of staff, um, where you're not positioning them between uh, the other heads and the C CEO. You're you're putting them alongside the CEO, and you're having them work in partnership, yeah. right? So it's you're not trying to to relieve the CEO from the pressure of having ten direct reports. You are you are acknowledging that their schedule is busy and that they need some they need a backstop sometimes and i think that's the difference right is if you have a ceo who can't actually manage 10 direct reports you probably don't have the right ceo agreed can i tell you by the way just as a as a dumb aside i this will tell you how green i was of only a few short years ago um at one point after leaving hulu i interviewed with uh some big company comcast or something like that and i got a fairly like fairly good introduction to the person i was talking to and it turned out i was talking to you know somebody's chief of staff which in my brain, because of the way that we used to do titles at Hulu, I thought was just like a fun, kitschy title that somebody had picked. And so when I got on the phone with them, I'm like, God, I love that title. That's so great. And I'm sure on the other end, they were just like, the hell is this idiot? <laughs> so, so yeah, I was, I was not a bright young man. Um, I will say this though. I think that you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, the one, um, 
image that really struck me from this particular article was the the structure done wrong sort of the example to avoid in which yeah. you know sort of short-term needs are sort of structured against each other and then in the end aren't really thought of in the long term as being sort of you know what are the short-term ones that need to be grouped together what are the, sh the long-term ones that need to be grouped together and and how do we make sure that those are counterbalanced so that it's not all just feeding up you know the waterfall so to speak um yeah so so for those of you who haven't read the article one one of the things that, that they talk about is this the, the the other wrong way to use a coo is to have it roll up several of those functions to a coo and roll up some other folks functions to a president and some other functions to a cfo and then have those people report to the ceo right and the, the problem is as jason was describing if you have um if you have for instance a um a short-term focused function like sales and a long-term function focused function like marketing, focused on you know long-term brand awareness right. and, and branding, reporting to one executive who then reports to the CEO, you are you are forcing either one to become supporting of the support to become a support function of the other, or you are you are insulating the CEO from that natural tension. And having the natural tension between the short term right. and the long-term focus is how you get the best decisions. Right. Conflict. And, and if you're yeah, conflict exactly. is the, the conflict is actually can be good. Yeah. Right. If you, if it's handled in a, in a you know in a mature way. Conflict is actually a very good thing because it 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 helps it helps us hone in on on what the actual best decision is. Right, which is why when we have arguments, we settle it with bare knuckle boxing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, you you settle with bare knuckle. I use brass knuckles because yeah, I want to win. Yeah, you do. Can I? Can I by the way, can, can we agree to limit it to a roll of pennies and not a roll of quarters? <laughs> good lord, my jaw is still recovering. Um, yeah, <laughs> or thumb wrestling, as Frank says. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that one of the things that we often think about when building businesses, and I'm certainly guilty of this as well, is particularly when you're the guy who starts it, you think of that sort of everything from the top descending down from you, and it's a very common thing to to you know want to think about. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that a lot of companies would be able to successfully move away from those models, in part because I think that shaking that foundation would shake a lot of the things that make that company what it is, and that would be very challenging for them. Um, yeah, you know, I know that that. Ultimately, in the end, you have to build something that is at least manageable, if not scalable. And for some companies, they're happy with manageable. It's not necessarily right. It's just right for them. Yeah. yeah. And so actually, the scaling thing is, is another one that I, that I like. So the second of these articles that I post, and I'll add that to the, to the chat again, um, is goes into sort of some of the, the, the classic mistakes in organizational structure overall. And, and one of the things that I really liked here is um, particularly applicable to startups and high growth companies is separating the idea of of roles and employees from business functions mm -hmm. so the idea that you know maybe you only have three people at the company in the beginning but rather than deciding you know one of those is going to be responsible for sales and marketing you say okay here are the functions that we need we need sales we need marketing we need you know x y and z and this person who you know in in the other method you might make head of sales and marketing, we're going to say, okay, this person really, their, their, their core function is, is marketing. They're mostly a marketing person. They're not so much a salesperson. So we're going to say, this person is our head of marketing, our VP of marketing, whatever. And they are temporarily wearing the sales hat yeah. until we find someone to, to hire into that. Right. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot easier than trying to separate those out later on when you realize this person can't do both those things. No, I'm, yeah. In in my business, as an example, right now we're small enough where I can help do all the you know all the marketing strategy that we need to be building for clients, while at the same time building out you know our business development pipeline. I can't do both forever as we start to scale. In fact, I've made it very clear that once we're done with you know sort of everything, the very next hire needs to be somebody to take over marketing strategy and marketing you know relationships because I can't you know I can't uh, I can't do both. It's 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 not only not right, it's uh, you know it's not workable. It's not it's not consistent, and I think uh, our business would suffer for it if I were to do it for too long. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's yeah. Get those nice. resumes. Get those resumes ready now. In that uh, <laughs> we're so not ready for that yet. <laughs> all, all the more reason to get to Jason before he's ready. Um, so the, the other thing that I that I like about this, we talked a little bit about that idea of the short term versus long term um, focus. But the other things that are that are sort of dangerous, and I think a lot of folks have seen have seen some of these before. Particularly entrepreneurs are familiar with this next one: the idea of um, if you consolidate functions that are focused on effectiveness with functions that are focused on efficiency, right? So you, you have some functions like say um, operations mm -hmm. uh, where the goal is to, um, 
the goal is to uh, minimize costs and 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 maximize stability and 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 keep things keep keep managing the status quo mm -hmm. right the um contrast that with for example uh long term r and d where the goal is to try something new and and uh, and innovative yeah and folks who have you know who have seen a a r and d function put under the technology group can tell you just how well that works right um you 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 have the um the problem of this of this you know stability versus versus innovation and i guess maybe a better example is um if you look at say uh hr departments where they've they've paired together the um, risk mitigation part of hr with the people development part of hr right you you, you have hr trying to both uh, yeah. minimize costs and maximize you know personnel development um and if you don't have those as you know two separate executives focused on those, it's very hard to to, to benefit from the tension between those two things. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, I'll, I'll let us get away from this organizational design. As you can tell, this is oh, this, this is, is an area that's near and dear to my yeah, heart. Yeah, this is this is where Teague really nerds out, guys. We should be should be absolutely clear about that. Um, yeah. Well, the other the uh, one other thing I wanted to make sure that we touched on, um, just because I think it's an interesting thing right now that doesn't get discussed nearly as much as it should. Um, there was a 538 article, uh, and if you guys don't read 538, if you're looking for really good political, um, economic, sports-related just numbers, right? They're as unbiased as you can get and are purely based in sort of the statistics of things. Um, there's an interesting you article. Could probably credit, you could probably credit 538 for, for starting some of the, uh, the, the, the data scientist boom. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I think given the predictions of the last couple of elections and the fact that Nate Silver has very publicly shown where they fail, uh, you know, every now and again, I think is important. Um, but there was a feature recently that I think is worth perusing uh, about college students who, um, you know, who are currently abusing Adderall. And for those of you who've been to college in the last 10 or 15 years, you'll know that this is not a new thing. Adderall is a you know, remarkable drug for many people who have learning disabilities. It's also really good recreationally for learning how to, you know, for basically focusing for 12 hours straight on some task that you need to get done. Um, what I think is really interesting about it is that, that although it doesn't talk about it directly, it does talk about young adults who, who abuse it. And the truth of the matter is there's a real problem with it in the startup space. Um, you know, folks who feel pressured to, you know, achieve and build and grow and, you know, and, and scale and model and blah, blah, blah. And they, they end up, you know, sort of going down the path of recreational drug use as, as a part of it. Um, and the truth of the matter is, well, or maybe not, maybe not recreational, but, but off label self-medication. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, well, and that's the problem. It can lead to abuse. I mean, I think that, that, yeah. you know, we can have a much longer discussion about the disparity between economic and socioeconomic groups in America and how drug, you know, sort of how prescription drug abuse is treated for each one. But I think it's important to note that, you know, in this world, there's still challenges around that. Um, I think that, that, you know, I think it's worth bringing up simply because I think it's the kind of thing that, that we don't talk about often enough. Um, I think it's the kind of, of issue that is, certainly a problem for some and doesn't get addressed. Um, so I just thought I'd throw it out there. That would be, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't quite work the way that the TV show limitless would have us believe. I think that's the point. Yeah. Um, you know, some of them may, as Nick is pointing out, that's true. Um, but it's very easy to start, uh, you know, start to abuse them, particularly if they're not prescribed and, or, you know, watched over by a doctor, um, you know, we can have the discussion some other time about whether whether they're okay by themselves. I don't have a particular feeling about it one way or the other. I think it's sort of individual. But when you abuse them without any real medical knowledge and then you start to use them as a crutch, that's where the problem starts to happen. And I think it happens a lot in startups. And anyway, I like to throw these things out there because every now and again, it sparks an interesting conversation. So there we go. It's also a great premise for, uh, for I think, n numerous science fiction series. Sure. Sure. The idea of you know what what happens when 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 we try to improve upon humans. Well, and can we just talk about the the movie Lucy, where you know, oh, you only use ten percent of your brain. That's a lie. That is false. not how that works. That is, totally false. That is not how we work. That is not a yeah. thing. And that movie and, was a dumb idea. 
And it, it wasn't the only movie, right? Wasn't there another movie around the same time with the pretty much exactly the same false premise? Well, Limitless was kind of that way. I mean, yeah, oh I yeah. That's... Well, and, and as Frank points out, the movie Defending Your Life does use this concept, but it uses it more in a humorous way. And if you've never seen it, it's totally worth watching because the idea is that you use, you know, you use a percentage of your brain and that when you're in heaven, the more that you access, the more essentially planes of existence you get to exist on. It's actually really funny. Um, for me, if we were to put a percentage against it, it would be two. <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah, there's a great bit. There is a great bit in that movie where Albert Brooks's character immediately at the beginning dies, goes to heaven, and everything he eats is the most delicious thing he's ever had. So he goes for sushi, and he's like, this is the best sushi I've ever had. And then he goes for pizza. This is the best pizza I've ever had. It just keeps going. There is no, there's like, apparently in heaven, everything is the best, which sounds pretty good. I'm not Seems good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go for it. Cool. Um, well, T, we've got five minutes left uh, before we're going to call it. Is there any other topic or subject or question that we haven't touched on that you think we should, uh, we should, uh, you know, engage the people on, as the kids say? Nobody says that. I was, I was, I was not going to call you out on that, but, but since we did, yeah, I, I don't think anybody says, should we engage the people on this? Yeah, exactly. Well, I do, I do want to throw out uh, Kiki uh, from our our distinguished audience here did uh, come up with a little Shakespeare to our question mm -hmm. earlier about launching. And if, if I may. So this, this setting up the, the premise for this, we, we, um, when we, when we ask for guests from the chat, we, we ask, you know, no, no promotion and no, mon no self-promotion, no monologues. Um, and, and Kiki took this as a challenge and, uh, and wrote us a little monologue, which Jason, the, the theater, the theater major will now perform. For <clears> us. <throat> hold on. I have to warm up. Mm -hmm, blah, 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 blah. All right. Hold on. <laughs> to launch. Or not to launch? That is the question. Whether tis nobler in the startup ecosystem to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous employment or to take arms against that sea of troubles and by opposing startup. Thank you. Mm. I gotta tell you, not since Shakespeare have I been so moved. That was... Bravo. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> Oh, I thought I froze again. Oh my gosh. Oh no, you're good. You're good. We totally got that. It was excellent. All right. Good. Although <laughs> before we lose you again, maybe we should wrap up. Yeah, that seems fair. <laughs> that seems fair. Um, Teague, how can everybody find you on the internet? You can find me at Teague Hopkins on Twitter or TeagueHopkins.com. And cool. I will be happy to geek out about more organizational design with anybody who will listen. Absolutely. Uh, you can find me at Jason Ellis on Twitter, or you can find my company, which I'll be talking about sometime in a future episode, at brllnt.co. That's brilliant without the vowels.co. Um, Teague, hopefully next week we will have some guests lined up so these pe poor people don't have to listen to us every time. But uh, you have anything, any thoughts to share with everybody before we take off? I think my final thought is this. Oh, 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 oh,